I, I don't. I don't think I need this. But uh, you know, if you if you can't hear me, let me know. But usually I'm too loud, so I think that'll be a problem. Um, before I begin my remarks, I, I just want to thank you all for coming today. Uh, I know how nerve wracking it is to put on a program, and you think, "God, it's going to be a great program," and then you know, four people show up. So thank you so much for taking the time to come today and, and, and hear me and, and participate in this program. And um, I want to thank Dean Clatterbuck, I love saying that, um, along with the Women's Studies Center for inviting me to come and speak with you today. It's an honor. And uh, Nanette Clatterbuck and I were actually high school debate partners. And I really credit that competitive debate and um, a forensics experience in high school and college with making me the opinionated, outspoken person I am today so in many ways. Nanette and I have come full circle today. <laughs> Um, I was born and raised in Marshall, Michigan, and I haven't been home in a while, so it's really lovely to be back in this part of the country. I don't miss the snow, however. They said it might snow today. I was not, you know, I'm excited about that. Um, I'm a cradle Catholic, and although I didn't go to Catholic school, uh, my son did attend St. Mary's School in Greenville, South Carolina from kindergarten through eighth grade, and I'm really convinced that that built a really solid academic um, foundation for him, allowing him to graduate with honors from high school and, and get a, a scholarship to his college. Um, I consider myself a Franciscan now. Um, I sort of broke off. I have, you know, some, some difficulties with the rules. And um, so I joined a Franciscan church, and I feel really comfortable and at home there. It's in a kind of a poor neighborhood in Greenville. And uh, it's a pioneer church uh, outreach to the black community. And uh, unfortunately, liberal white people are taking it over. But um, it's a great uh, church, and it's really renewed my Catholicism. Um, I do appreciate, however, your founders, St. Thomas Aquinas's belief in the importance of having an open mind and an open heart and learning from your life experience. I totally believe in that. Part of my broadcasting and voiceover training is the ability to talk really fast. I can do 45 seconds of copy in 30 seconds. So I tend to get really fast talking. So if I get on a roll and I'm just not making any sense, you feel like you're at a speed reading seminar, just throw up your hand and I'll try to slow down. And I, and I mean that sincerely because I, 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 I think people are bored, so I speed up. Uh, my story, my little drama begins in August of 2002. My husband and I were spending the weekend at this lovely resort on Hilton Head Island called Harbor Town. And we were uh, attending the South Carolina Broadcasters Association's annual award ceremony. And I'd been nominated in two categories, Radio Show of the Year and person Radio Personality of the Year. And I won in both those categories. And it was just a wonderful capstone of 20 plus years in broadcasting. And I was flushed with victory after the award ceremony. And we're preparing for bed. And my husband casually remarked to me, they can't fire you now, can they? And I laughed, you know, because I thought, yeah, <laughs> they can. And uh, they probably will eventually, because in a lot of ways, 2002, 2003 were like the best of times and the worst of times for me, because I was really hitting my stride professionally, and I <coughs> won some awards, and I was writing this column, and I was really happy, and things were going well, but things at work were not going well. And um, I actually was terminated from that job in April of 2003, right after the war started. And the termination followed months of verbal reprimands and intimidation and outright censorship of my anti-war statements. I later filed suit against my employer's Clear Channel for violating a, a very obscure South Carolina law which forbids employers from terminating or penalizing their employees for expressing political views in the workplace. I mediated a settlement to that lawsuit in 2005, but my radio career effectively ended in April 2003. I've been thinking a lot about the meaning of the old saying, no good deed goes unpunished. And I, I, I rewrote this section because I read it to my husband. He goes, you're really depressing here, Roxanne. And I said, <laughs> OK, I'll, you know, let me rethink this. But um, I was sort of raised by my parents to believe that if you do good things, good things will come to you. And what I really found out was if you do the right thing, sometimes you get your ass kicked. And you get it kicked hard. And it, that was a really weird, hard, sad lesson for me because I felt you know, I'd achieved my, you know, my pinnacle in my career. And I had, you know, I, I thought about 10 years left in my career. And it just ended rather abruptly. And I didn't really have a plan, you know. And I felt um, very alone at that point. And I've, I've kind of gotten past it. But it, it, I think you do have sort of that thing. If you stand up and do the right thing, you're going to, you know, good things are going to happen. It just never occurred to me that my liberal views would prove so offensive or unpopular that I would be openly censored or eventually even blackballed from my profession. And that's exactly what happened to me, the Dixie Chicks, uh, broadcaster Charles Goyette that I know, and some other broadcasters and writers in this country in the run-up to the Iraq War. 
And what is very sad to me is that although public opinion has turned against this war, the fallout for outspoken anti-war activists continues. Um, I had a great example, but I really like this one better. So in the New York Times on Wednesday, the headline read, display of anti-Bush sign has competitive bridge world in an uproar, okay? And you think, competitive bridge world? <laughs> okay, let me explain that. Um, there are some people who play bridge competitively, and Warren Buffett and uh, Bill Gates um, play competitively, and they have fun doing that. There are some people that actually make money playing competitive bridge, and the female team from the U.S. won the Venice Cup Championship in Shanghai recently, and they were really excited. And there, it's an international competition, and there's lots of people there from other countries, and they were getting a lot of static about the Iraq War and the Bush administration. So very impulsively, when they went up on the awards platform before they got their trophy and you know had the pictures taken, one of the ladies wrote on the back of a menu, uh, "We did not vote for Bush," and held it up. And there's a picture here, which you know you can see. But anyway, they held it up impulsively, and the pictures were taken. Well, <laughs> this was not good. Okay. Um, and I'll just read one quote, which I found very enlightening. Robert S. Wolf, who's one of the country's preeminent bridge players, who has served as executive and board member for several bridge organizations, said he understood that the women might have had a legal right to do what they did, but that they had offended many people. Quote, while I believe in the right to free speech, to me that doesn't give anyone the right to criticize one's leader at a foreign venue in a totally non-political event. So what you're seeing is in 2007 exactly what happened to the Dixie Chicks. They were in London. They were getting a lot of static about the, um, the Iraq War and, and Bush. So they get up and, and um, uh, Natalie Maines very spontaneously said, just so you know, we're embarrassed that Bush is from Texas. That's all they said, okay? And let me just tell you, the fallout from that, if you shut up and sing, is a great documentary. I would urge you to rent that DVD and watch it. But they were at the peak of their career, and they were basically banned by Clear Channel um, from on air. Um, Clear Channel sort of led the movement to, you know, burn their DVDs, and um, you know they were just hated. And it, it really has they have not re really recovered from that since. So that's you know 2003, and now we're in 2007. And there seems to be this sort of feeling that if you're overseas, you can't criticize our leader. Not really sure you know, where that law is written, but people apparently still believe it. Um, this experience really shattered my belief that if you do the right thing, it all works out in the end. And, and maybe it does, but it's taken a long time. The karma thing is just a real slow burn, you know? <laughs> So for me, the reward in all this was being true to my personal integrity and speaking the truth. And I replay this a million times a day. Um, there was a one particular incident that led to my firing, and it was about taking down the statue of Saddam and wrapping the flag around it. And I replay that and how I could have reacted or not reacted to that. And there's really no way that I would have done anything different. So it, it is what it is. And I am who I am, and I thought all along this was a bad thing, and I you know, I wouldn't change that. And what I found in doing research for this is there's really nothing new about this situation. There's lots of other examples of political and professional persecution throughout history. Author and broadcaster Studs Terkel recently wrote about being blacklisted professionally during the McCarthy era because he had signed petitions which were considered Marxist opposing Jim Crow laws and poll taxes and in favor of rent control and passism. And his career was really on the, low, on the down low for several years after that. And even though I lived and worked in Greenville, South Carolina, home of Bob Jones University, often referred to as the buckle of the Bible belt, I'd always been encouraged on air to express my liberal, feminist, political, and personal opinions as part of my radio show, which was very unusual. And, and I, you know, it, it led itself to the chemistry of the show. My partner's very conservative. I was very liberal, very vocal, uh, very opinionated, and not afraid of expressing that. So they recognized that that was a good show, and they allowed me to do that. I just want to say that during the Bush administration, I thought my role would continue and things would be okay, and there was just this sharp turn that we took. And I took for granted that free speech meant unfettered, uncensored speech that, while it might be controversial and unpopular, would be permissible in a free and democratic society, and that just wasn't the case after 9-11 because we became sort of this fear-dominated Big Brother kind of America. What began happening to me is that criticism of the Bush administration's foreign policy was labeled unpatriotic and un-American. And open discussion was stifled as a result. 
Many broadcasters begin to self-censor to avoid public criticism and in some cases to maintain their employment. Everything, and I mean everything, changed in broadcasting, not only after 9-11, but also after the Telecommunications Act of 1996 was signed into law by President Clinton. The ground began to shift once radio broadcasting ownership regulations were scrapped and huge corporations like Clear Channel began buying up hundreds and eventually thousands of radio stations around the country. The ability to almost totally wipe out competition and diversity in local marketplaces resulted in the elimination of tens of thousands of jobs and the disappearance of public service programming on our public airways. Local personalities were dismissed in favor of pre-recorded voice tracking from distant cities where they used a handful of people at a very low cost to perform the work once done by talented individuals who lived in the communities in which they worked. The number of minority and female-owned radio stations in this country in the marketplace has plunged dramatically as a result of deregulation. One of the reasons I believe the American public overwhelmingly supported going to war with Iraq is the near unified message transmitted by mainstream media in favor of the war. The reports and expert testimony contradicting Iraq's possession of weapons of mass destruction were available. They just weren't widely circulated or they were buried in the back of, of newspapers. Ignorance might be bliss, but it's also very dangerous. The American public was quite literally brainwashed to believe that Iraq was a deadly threat and that preemptive war was the only solution to this threat. It bothered me that we didn't even have a public debate over it. It was just considered, we're doing it, and we did it would appear that the brainwashing of the American public by mainstream media was extremely effective and continues while the Iraq war rages on. The, Americans, the, public, the American public's ignorance of current events makes manipulation of public opinion almost too easy. In June of this year, Newsweek magazine conducted a poll that found that 41%, 41% of the American public still believes that Saddam Hussein's regime was directly involved in planning, financing, or carrying out the attacks of 9-11. Some people still believe there were weapons of mass destruction, you know, that they were there. Newsweek's pollsters also found that 81% of those surveyed were unable to name the Chief Justice of the United States. 19% said they could answer that question, but nearly half of those people got it wrong, <coughs> naming someone other than John Roberts. Only 11% of Americans polled correctly identified the Chief Justice. That's the same number, 11%, who believed that the United States has already tracked down and captured Osama bin Laden. Sadly, but not surprisingly, 18% of Americans can correctly identify the winner of this year's American Idol contest. Manipulation of the media is nothing new in American culture. The late great political commentator and author Walter Lippmann wrote extensively in the 40s and 50s about the media's role in manufacturing consent to war at the direction of government officials. Lippmann labeled those who would sacrifice the truth to so-called patriotism as destroyers of liberty of opinion and agents of intolerance. Lippmann also said that those who would subvert the American constitutional system of self-government believe that to patriotism, as they define it from day to day, all other considerations must yield. That is their pride. And yet, what is this but one more among myriad examples of the doctrine that the end justifies the means? A more insidiously misleading rule of conduct was, I believe, never devised among men. For Lippmann, free, unfettered access to the truth in the public forum was essential to democracy. Unfortunately, what Lippmann wrote about in the mid-1900s continues today, with pundits and talking heads guiding public opinion rather than relying on investigative journalism and factual reporting. There's another contributing factor to our current state of affairs, and that's a lack of activism on the part of the younger generation. New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman recently labeled this demographic group Generation Q. He called them the quiet Americans in the best sense of that term. Indeed, uh, they were they're quietly pursuing their idealism at home and abroad. Some polls show young people volunteering at uh, the highest level recorded for use in 40 years, and that's great. However, volunteering for civic causes is not enough. Friedman writes that America needs a jolt of idealism, activism, and outrage from Generation Q. He goes on to say Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy didn't change the world by asking people to join their Facebook crusades or to download their platforms. Activism can only be uploaded the old-fashioned way by young voters speaking truth to power, face to face, in big numbers on campuses or on the Washington Mall. Virtual politics is just that, virtual. Friedman mentions James Meredith, the first African American to be admitted to Ole Miss in 1962. Above his statue on the Ole Miss campus is the word courage. 
Friedman says, and I agree, courage is the driving force behind activism, and there is no substitute for that. If the image of iconic heroes like Martin Luther King Jr. or James Meredith intimidate you and make you feel small and powerless, and I've heard that over and over, every time I speak I hear, I can't make a difference, it's depressing, I live in a conservative place, oh, what am I going to do? Um, you have to think about um, the words which I found incredibly inspiring of Sonia Tinsley, a young African-American activist from Atlanta who said, I think it does us all a disservice when people who work for social change are presented as saints, as so much more noble than the rest of us. We get a false sense that from the moment they were born, they were called to act, never had any doubts, they were bathed in a circle of light. I'm much more inspired learning how people succeeded despite their failings and uncertainties. It's a much less intimidating image. It makes me feel like I have a shot at changing things too. I read an interview recently with activist Roman Catholic nun Sister Jean Chittister who had this to say on the subject of activism. If you define serenity as blind acceptance of a bad situation, then I'm not serene. But if you define serenity as being willing to surrender to present circumstances while to present circumstances while keeping a vision of a better future in mind than I am that. I know that change comes slowly, but I also know that massive injustice will continue if nobody points out the emperor has no clothes. Mahatma Gandhi was often described as serene, but he also led India to independence from Great Britain, all the while adhering to a doctrine of peaceful civil dis disobedience. And it took decades. Serenity is being aware of both what is and what can be, and having the courage and the patience to get from the former to the latter, or at the very least, as Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see in the world. The opposite of serenity is destroying what is in pursuit of what ought to be, and those who take that route destroy themselves as well as the society around them. I want to leave you with a really stirring call to action, which, and I, I was struggling to finish the speech because it wasn't strong enough. And I found this wonderful book, and it was called The Impossible Will Take a Little While. And it's different um, activists and, and people, and it's an incredibly inspiring book. And I found a lot of great material in here. So if you think you can't make a difference, I, I promise you reading this will make, will make you feel inspired. In the book, playwright and activist Tony Kushner um, is excerpted from an, an essay that he entitled, Despair is a Lie We Tell Ourselves. Quote, I do not believe the wicked always win. I believe our despair is a lie we are telling ourselves. In many other periods of history, people, ordinary citizens, routinely set aside hours, days, time in their lives for doing the work of politics, some of which is glam and revolutionary, and some of which is dull and electoral and tedious and not especially pure. And the world changed because of the work they did. That's what we're starting now. It requires setting aside the time to do it and then doing it. Not any single one of us has to or possibly can save the world, but together in some sort of concert, and in not especially coordinated concert, with all of us working where we see work to be done, the world will change. And we have to do it by showing up places, our bodies in places, turn off the computers, leave the web and the net, and show up our bodies at meetings and demonstrations and rallies, leafleting corners, because this is a moment in history that needs us to begin. Begin each of us every day at his or her own pace, slowly and surely rediscovering how to be politically active, how to organize our disparate energies into effective group action. And I choose to believe we will do what is required. Act, organize, assemble, oppose, resist. Find a place, a cause, a group, a friend, and start today. Now, now, now. Continue, continue, continue. Being politically active is for the citizens of a democracy maybe the best way of speaking to God and hearing her answer, you exist. If we are active, if we are activists, she replies to us, you specifically exist. Mazel tov. Now get busy, she replies. Maintain the world by changing the world. Thank you. And I hope there's some questions, because I love the stimulating discussion that follows. Yes? Uh, the Impossible Will Take a Little While. It's a citizen's guide to hope in a time of fear. The Impossible Will Take a Little While. And it's been out a while, so you should be able to get the library. Okay? Um, it's compiled, it's edited by Paul Rogat Loeb, L-O-E-B, and it's excerpts from different readings and essays and, and stories, historical and, and present day. It's a great book. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, right. Right. 
Okay. I, I find it fascinating because I have a group that I founded in Greenville called Open Forum, and um, we watch the Al Gore movie Inconvenient Truth. And um, my lawyer was there, and um, he said, "Well, I don't know. I don't know." And I, I'm thinking, "What? You don't know what?" Um, what I believe about global warming and a lot of issues um, is that the conservatives and, um, are incredibly effective at um, staying on message, at knowing what their message is, at funding conservative think tanks and other organizations, and they have wide access to the media. They have a ton of people out there that stay on message, that beat the drum. And um, there's a, a guy in my poetry group gave me this thing, and he said, look at this, Roxanne. And it was anti-global warming. And I, and I Googled the guy, and he was like the shill. He was a shill for Exxon. Oh, pff, yeah, he works at James, George Mason University or whatever, and he's a, you know, a doctor in chemistry, but he's a shill. You know? So then you look at the research on the other side, which is you know, uh, peer-reviewed scientists who are not funded by any industry, who are academics and scientists, and the preponderance of the evidence is clear. And now it just becomes, what shall we do? And I read recently where Newt Gingrich is, has written a book, and he's talking about global warming Israel, and we need to work towards change. So incrementally, we're getting there. But they have been incredibly effective at stalling and delaying you know, the move towards change, because they're really good at that. And that's really hampered us. So. And their motives it, it's it's it, it's oil. They, it's fossil-based fuels. They, you know, the oil industry has never made bigger profits. Oil is at an all-time high. It's all about the money. Whenever you think, what's the issue? It's all about the money. And when they any any issue for me, like when they talk about, um, when people talk about, do you, you know, free market-based solutions and all that stuff. The reason the federal government had to put regulations in place is because. It, you can't trust corporations to do the right thing. They're in it to make money. They're publicly traded. It's the bottom line. It's driving the stock price up, up and making the investors happy and getting those dividends up. They could give a damn. Now, if you make it, if you have the political will of the people that says, we demand change, you know, we want it, then they'll do it, but they're not going to do it on their own. And that's why you have the federal government standing there saying, you can't pollute, you've got to have you know, higher fuel standards, you've got to do these things because they won't do it on their own and you've got to force them to do it. And if you watch the, the film, Who Killed the Electric Car, I, I am still not over that. I'm still not over that in the freaking 70s, we had electric cars that could have changed, transformed our country, the incredibly popular, clean burning, uh, very fuel efficient. Um, you know, they burned no fuel. They were easy to maintain. They had great reliability. They didn't want that because it was about the money. They can't make money on that, so they, they didn't want to do that. So the more you know, I think the more outraged you become, and that's, that's the thing. You've got to know more. And you were talking about if you don't decide, you decide. The other thing that I really encourage people to do, I'm in one, I swear, I'm in one of the most, all the 30% of the people that still love Bush, they all live in Greenville, you know? And <laughs> it's a really tough environment. But I, for, I long ago decided, decided that I know who I am, and I'm a liberal, I'm a feminist, and I'm going to reclaim those words, I'm going to stand up, I'm going to say, yeah, I'm a Catholic, I'm a mother, I'm a good person, but I'm also a liberal feminist. Those aren't swear words, those aren't bad things, those are good things. So if you, don't, if you remain quiet, if you go along to get along, if you're having, everybody's having a big discussion, they're all in agreement, Bush is great, we love this war, and you remain silent, then you're part of it. You're part of the conspiracy. And, and, it, and it does, I'm not saying you need to lob a firebomb in the next dinner party you go to, <laughs> but I'm just saying, you know, if you know who you are and you remain silent, then you're part of it. You know, you're agreeing with them. So it's, it's little things that you can do to make a difference. Okay, come on, somebody else. Yes? Um, that's an interesting question. Lowry Mays and his sons owned it. They're from Texas. Uh, they started out very small, and they started buying radio stations after 1996. Big contributors to Bush. Um, before that, um, a, another gentleman who also was a huge contributor to Bush and got a appointment to a, a, a prestigious board in Texas owned um, the entity that became Clear Channel. And um, they are now, what I had predicted after deregulation became a fact, and what I thought was they'd drive up the price, buy all these radio stations, 
fire a lot of people, you know, make a lot of money, and then they'll divest. They'll they'll fl they'll they'll say, okay, we you know the market's fragmenting, you know, not enough profits. Now we're going to unload. Just now, this year, um, Lowry Mays and his son sold Clear Channel. Then they're taking it private. They're going to um, they divested it. It was a long drawn out affair, but they sold the company. And now I think what you'll start to see is the new investors will start flaking off those unprofitable radio stations, and hopefully the price will be a little softer and more individuals will be able to get back in and buy back some of those radio stations. But it's taken, it's been devastating. I mean, it, it really devastated our industry. And, you know, they're all about, they made a lot of money. I mean, they made billions of dollars. And, it, you know, and I, I, like I, I know people in broadcast who've been in the business 20, 30 years, and they'll never work again. And the people that are in the business are miserable. So he, he, he took a great industry, an industry that I love, that I just was incredibly proud of, and they, they've destroyed it. So, but they made money. So, all right, come on, somebody else. Yes, sir. Right. They brought me down to their lowest station, and, and, and it was just political exercise. And you get the lowest rate on their rate card. Right. That's why they don't want to sell to you, because it's valuable to time. And they don't want they give it away at a low rate. That's right. But in as much as the FCC regulates and controls these stations, somebody who is interested in running for office to get their message out mm. doesn't do it. Right. Because they have that control. Right. Now, where does that go? How do we deal with that? Is that still the case today? All right, absolutely, and and y y that's a great point because they don't want to sell it to you because it's a low rate and and especially if it's a, a it's a good time period where they can make a lot of money. They don't want to do that. Well, that's what you want to right, to see what you're doing right. Time. And see, when we had decent regulation, you had equal time. You had public service programming that would devote an hour long show to having both candidates on the air. Um, a couple things about that. Um, I, we need better regulation. I, I, they talk about the fairness doctrine. I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in the fairness doctrine at all. I want um, regulation of ownership because what's happened, there was a massive report that I just read about radio in America. What happened after deregulation was the corporations bought all these stations and they eliminated competition in the marketplace. They became a corporate entity. So there was no local ownership. There's no local input. Um, the mandate for public service programming is gone. It's up to the radio station so they don't do it. Or if they do it, they bury it. It's like, you know, 2 in the morning or 6 in the morning on Sunday. That's when my show was. <laughs> Great time clock. Um, so they either don't do it or they put you in a lousy slot. So um, there's a myth in America that liberal progressive talk can't make money. It's not, it's not a good format. And the reason liberal talk progressive radio isn't out there is because conservative talk radio dominates the marketplace. And if you had diversity of ownership, you have diversity of views. And when people call it the liberal media, that is such a scream to me. I mean, there is no liberal media. I mean, I don't even think you call NPR or, or public, you know, public television or radio, you know, liberal, because they're very balanced. They'll do conservative and, and liberal views. But the only way that we're going to change things is two things, public financing of campaigns. So it do, you don't have to be rich. Exactly, because if you're not rich, you can't run because you can't buy time. And it's all about the TV and the radio ads. That's, that's the bottom line. And the other thing is, is re-regulation of, of radio. And what frightens me is Kevin Martin at the FCC wants to deregulate television by Christmas. He wants to deregulate ownership so that um, he's going to save newspapers with this. Um, so that one, a corporation can own a television and a newspaper in the same community, in the same market. And it's a very frightening thing, and he's kind of pushing it through really quick. And, you know, there have been some hearings and stuff, but the reason that we stopped it before three years ago was two million people rose up and said, no, we don't want that. So that's the next fight that we have on our hands is the deregulation of television. 
and this whole idea of this Reagan deal where free market, let the free market decide. I mean, I am just appalled by that. You know, we have a government in place to regulate, to force people to protect the people. And we don't have, I mean, we have, he, we have been deregulated to the point uh, that it's frightening to me. So, yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of Bill Moyers. Yeah, I love he him. They has, he has a lousy time slot. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, he, that's been a big yes. issue of his yes. um, for a long time. And he did a recent show, The Selling of the War. Yeah. Again, a lot of people just don't see right. those shows. But when I watch that show, over and over again, I ask myself, these people are brilliant. Why aren't they running for public office? We really get stuck with politicians I know. and the people who know something. I know. Really any see. I don't necessarily want Bill to run for politics. I just want him to have a decent time slot, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Oh, here's. Okay. And I, I got to say something else. Uh, I was talking to the young lady, uh, Kristen, who brought me over here, and she's working at a Clear Channel station. She's talking about Sean Hannity. This is what I love. Okay. This is what I love when you talk about balance. Okay. Whenever, and you watch this now, when, and I want you to pay attention, whenever you see one of those shows like Tim Russer and, you know, the, uh, the TV news shows, They'll have, they'll attempt balance, okay? They'll have, you know, well-known conservative, Pat Buchanan, blah, blah, you know, somebody like that. And then, you know, you got the handsome Sean Hannity, who's very, you know, I was on his show, he's very bombastic, he's very aggressive, he's good looking, you know. And then you got ugly, wimpy Alan Combs, okay? <laughs> I mean, that is deliberate. That is deliberate. No, on some of those shows, they'll bring in some goofball that I never heard of to be the liberal, you know? And, and they're crazy. I mean, they're either they can't articulate or they just look stupid. And that is so deliberate. I mean, so, you know, watch that now and, and see what I'm talking about. They'll have four conservatives, one wimpy liberal, you know. So, and, and, they, and statistically, if you analyze the news shows, it's dominated by Republicans. You know, they'll throw a few little Democrats in there, you know, once in a while. But, you know, but going back to Bill Moyers, I have such deep respect for him and what I love and I mentioned this earlier I love I do love the internet in that you get you gain access like I, I you know Bill Moyers is you know somebody sent me frontline about um, rendition that was an incredible show so if you can't sit and watch those shows at those weird time periods that they're on or remember to do it go on YouTube or, or mediamatters.org and and you'll read transcripts and you can click on video and you can watch incredible programming so it's out there you sort of seek it out um, and I don't think great people are going to run for political office until we get pu public financing. It's too expensive. You know, it's just too, it, people, if you don't have money, you're, you can't afford to run. I mean, I was watching um, Granny D. Did you, have you ever heard of her? She's a 92-year-old woman who walked across the country to, you know, rabble for public financing. She ran for Congress, and she was precious. I mean, but she had zero money, zero visibility, and she was, you know, a joke. I mean, people laughed at her, and she was, I mean, I loved her, but it, it, you're marginalized without the money and the name recognition. It's, it's a sad state, because we got a lot of great people that should be running, and they're not. So, yes, ma'am. I'd like to put in a plug for um, a local organization Good. that um, is really helpful if you want to get involved, in especially in Good. media issues, and that's the Grand Rapids um, Community Media Center. Good. Which is known Good. And um, it's um, and and they have volunteer. Um, uh, they're not DJs. What are they? Programmers. Good. And they also run the Wealthy Street Theater, and it's a, it's Fabulous. a um, very small staff with a large volunteer base. And the the slogan is, if you're not making media, media's making you. That's right. So um, go learn how to do it. And good for um, you. Thank you. Because uh, I do, I think it's important um, because people are kind of overwhelmed, you know, like they think, oh, God, what am I going to, I'm just me, I, I, I'm just one person. What I find incredibly uplifting is to go seek out groups like that or information and if there's a meeting, go, because there's nothing like finding like-minded people who may be more enlightened than you and have resources to lend you and uplift your spirit and make you feel like you can make a difference. And, you know, if you just sit in your room and you get all depressed, that's you know, not going to help. So 
you know, knowledge is one thing, and then you got to move to action. And the, and the way you do that is by seeking out people or forming your own little groups and voicing your opinions and talking and organizing. And, you know, it, it's not, it doesn't have to be a huge movement. It can just be, you know, the little things that you do. It all makes a difference. But we have to seek it out. Yes, sir. <coughs> Oh, yeah. There you go. Good for you. But there are people out there, and they are not complaining. And there are other than at home, where there's an actual amount of fear because scholarship is based on how you get things through. Financing jobs, anything. Right. Now, if I stand up and throw my fist in the air, right. Right. I, I agree. Well, for you know, you have to be selective. You know, like, and and I'm this stands out in my mind. When I went to the fourth anniversary protest against the war in Washington with my son, um, what was weird is like there was all these wonderful people and families, and they're all hearing their signs, and it's wonderful. And then you have the 9/11 conspiracy people. You know, and I'm like, <laughs> what's up with that? You know. And so I put some video on my website, and, and, and my, my son goes, huh, Dad, Mom, I don't think you want the 9-11 conspiracy people, you know? So you have to be selective. And I've been to some meetings where I thought, this is weird, you know? I mean, I, some people are like, you know, it's a, the conspiracy theorists and world domination and all that stuff. So be selective, but there are a lot of, you know, good people, you know? Um, I love, in fact, the organization um, that organized the protest was um, the guy who wrote God's Politics, and he has a lovely website, and he's a minister, James Wallace, thank you, he's wonderful. And we met at the National Cathedral, and we had a prayer service, and it was just incredibly inspiring. So there's so many people that are good, genuine, wonderful people that are Christians, that are good people. And you just have to be selective in who you associate with and then also what your rhetoric is, you know. Because I, I've, I've tended to kind of go off the edge myself a few times and that's not, then people just think you're crazy, you know. So that's not good. So, and be careful, yeah. Um, you said that you uh, or identify yourself as a feminist. Yes. Can you share with us um, your definition of feminism and also um, uh, how your feminism Okay. Um, coming up in a completely male-dominated field, okay, forced me to be, and, and I, I'm kind of a product of my upbringing. I had two older brothers. I basically was tormented verbally and physically every day throughout my childhood. So it was either toughen up or, you know, you're dead. So I had, I, you know, I was raised tough. My, you know, parents raised me to speak out and, you know, be who you are and, you know, know what you stand for so that was one thing and then I came into this radio thing and I was always the only girl and I didn't want to be the designated laugher or the and I'm obviously not the sex pot so um, I had to be something else and so I had to invent myself and um, I very you know I read Jermaine Greer and you know I was so excited when they were talking about um, uh, the now lady that you just you went to see, Gloria Steinem, I, that book changed my life. I mean, I, I remember being a young girl reading that thinking, oh my God, you know, this is so exciting. And so to be a female, you know, and be in a male-dominated, you know, field, you kind of had to be a little radical or you were going to get stomped on. And so I, you know, what I find amusing is when I ask women friends if they're a feminist, no, no, I'm not a feminist. And they are like, you know, accomplished, brilliant, smart, articulate, incredibly, you know, talented people. But they don't want to be labeled feminist because it's a negative word, you know. And what I urge you to do is take back the language. I mean, because like this goes back to how incredibly effective Republicans are in controlling the message and demonizing factions of our society that I am incredibly proud of. I think feminism is about equal rights. It's about uh, being a woman but not being afraid of your power. And that to me has kind of helped 
push me through life and let me be who I am and I, I'm, I'm proud of it. And I think it's just the verbiage more than being a strong, accomplished woman. You know, I think that people are just afraid to label themselves and you shouldn't be afraid of that. It's a good word. So. And how would you say then that has directly affected you? Just that I want the world to be better, you know, and I, it, what I find really troubling is that girls today and young women kind of take for granted stuff about like suffrage and and the Equal Rights Amendment and man we should have won that one you know and that damn Phyllis Shapley I mean I'm telling you <laughs> Dang. so we were fighting this fight for all this stuff and now women have this stuff that we fought for and they're kind of like eh. you know it's kind of like taking the civil rights thing for granted. You know, we are so close to that. I mean, that was the 60s. I mean, we're not that distant from that. So I, I, it just it troubles me that we've worked so hard to gain this ground. And now, you know, I see, you know, the only, you know, women on the, on the right that you'll notice are like crazy women like Ann Coulter. Would anyone listen to that woman if she was fat and ugly? No. But it's all about you know, who, what you look like, if you're pretty, if you're cute, you can say the most hateful, vicious things, and it'll be okay. And I, there's something wrong with that. And she's, and now she's attacking other women, you know, saying like women are too dumb to vote. And, you know, I mean, if that, I mean, that is incredibly offensive. So it, I, I don't know, it's all, the feminism thing is all bound up in the liberal thing for me. I mean, it's all sort of, I'm a woman, I, I, I'm open-minded, I want, a better world. So, I don't know any other. Did you have a question, Rachel? Okay. You mentioned the um, taxation benchmark versus legalization. Mm -hmm. Yes. Also, how you talked about earlier just kind of the lack of legal Right. Um, if you go to takebackthemedia.org, I think it'll kind of walk you through that. And they, and then if you get on those mailing lists, they'll they give you alerts on you know what the status of this regulation thing is. And um, if you Google Bill Moyers and media, you'll get some incredible stuff. And he'll give you a whole historical perspective about deregulation. But you got to get on some of those mailing lists to find out what's going on. And then they do letter writing campaigns, and you can customize the letter and. Trust me, if they get, if, if one congressman gets 2,000 letters on a subject, it makes them notice. I mean, and it, you know, I, I, ta I really believe that. We stopped that before because of the outcry. So you just got to educate. I mean, just Google media and, or go to takebackthemedia.org and, you know, find it. And they'll kind of guide you through what they're doing. And they did hearings across the country, and a lot of times they're in your area. So that's another great opportunity. And, and, I, and I mentioned earlier, there's, um, your congressmen, your senators do those town hall meetings. I love those. I love the town hall meeting because it's so fun to go. There's like 15 people. They're all like got their little issues, immigration, whatever it is. And if you raise your hand and rock their world, I mean, it's great. You know, you might get in the newspaper. It's going to be a lot of fun. So you got to do that. Somebody over here had their hand up. Yes. Yeah. There you go. Is another grcmc.org is another good. Good, because it's not too late. I'm hoping we'll stop that. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. In regards to activism. Yep. I was just saying. I wonder. Could you tell us why do you think that people said there's 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 a need to act to organize to take a stand? Yeah. Why do you think that? organize and take a stand on issues that were discussed on Dear Warrior, but not on Tap Smile. Why do you think, why do you think uh, that people would... No, I, I disagree because I, I you know, I, well, I used to... You know, I kind of hear you prioritizing mm -hmm. activism, mm -hmm. and I know that the media is your vocation, but I hear that, you know, the war, yeah. the uh, 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 deregulization, but right. why not... Oh, see, you got to find your passion. I mean, th these, you know, you can't be everything. You know, you can't be going to 900 different things, you know. So you got to find what's important to you and your world, you know. And domestic violence happens to be one of my things. And I went to a hearing and I raised some hell about, you know, South Carolina being one of the top, you know, we're in top five for d domestic partners killed by, by males. 
And so we have a very serious issue. So you just have to find your issue and find the truth and then fi figure out how you can do it. It's, it I, you know, I don't speak for everybody. I'm just speaking okay, for me. Right. Yeah. yeah. But, but, I, but I, my question is, I love why, Tavis. why would you think that people, are you saying it would be their passion to be activists when it comes to war, but not activists when it comes to child abuse? Oh, not at all. But, but let me just tell you something. I spent 16 years of my life um, volunteering to advocate for abused and neglected kids in family court. I was a guardian ad litem. And it's sad, but poor people and kids have no power in this country because they don't vote traditionally. The people that have the power are the people that vote and can organize. Most powerful faction, AARP. They're old and they vote, you know? And they got a mission, you know? So basically, it's harder, it's harder to make change about issues like poverty and child abuse and domestic violence because those are people on the margins. Those are people without power. So you have to seek out the groups that are trying to empower and move to change and speak out at forums and you know, you gotta find what flips your switch, what personally rocked your world. I mean, this is what rocked my world and this is why I am so passionate about it. But no, I love to have a smiley, I love Tom Joyner. I mean, I find it appalling that in this country the HIV and AIDS is the number one killer of young black women. And hardly anybody knows that. Nobody's doing anything about it. You know, we got celebrities raising money for AIDS in Africa. But who's raising money for AIDS in America? You know? Um, I was excited when I went to um, the movie uh, Why'd I Get Married? And uh, Tyler Perry cited that statistic, said HIV is the number one killer of young African-American women. I'm like, yeah, yeah, because that's going to be the first time those millions of people that are going to go to that movie heard that. So it's, it's, it's happening, but it's not at the pace that you want it. It's really slow. But you've got to find your passion and go for it. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Oh. God, yes. <laughs> My husband is a prostate cancer survivor, and when I was with Clear Channel, I had United Healthcare, which allowed us to go to Sloan Kettering and have a great treatment, and, and he's you know doing great, and he's cancer free and all that. I just find it appalling in America that you have forty, I think it's forty nine million Americans now that don't have health insurance. Um, right now, my husband and I are paying twelve hundred dollars a month for Cobra, and it's. Just, in, I, I, I don't, and again, I think what this is about is the total control of the media and the message, socialized medicine. People, Medicare is socialized medicine, and y'all like that. So what has to happen is don't just, you know, get those catchphrases and that, I mean, get beyond that. You know, when, when Giuliani talks about socialized medicine and touts fake statistics about what happens with prostate survivor rates here versus Great Britain, which is wrong, then you got to, you know, that's got to, I mean, they're lying. So yeah, I've got huge, and it's all about who gets elected president if, if we're going to move towards that. Because, you know, Republicans have absolutely no desire for national health care. They just don't want it. It's too expensive. They'd rather wage war and contribute to the Defense Department, you know. It's a matter of priorities. It's a matter of political will. So, and I think we're getting there. You have 49 million people that are, you know, going to die if something goes wrong, or number one cause of bankruptcy is, you know, illness in America. You know, serious illness. We've got, you know, people got to rise up. And I think we're almost there. So they killed it in '96 because of, you know, that stupid commercial. You know, Edna saying we don't want socialized medicine. It's sad that we're so easily manipulated. That the facts are right there. And people just, you know, manipulate you and talk you into believing stuff that's totally wrong. So it's it's sad. Okay. Yeah. You self-described yourself as a Catholic mother, liberal feminist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> An oxymoron. <laughs> See, I like that though, because in if you're in the Bible Belt and you say you're practicing some religion, then they don't hate you so much. So that's why I say that. You know, it's very deliberate. But, but I'm yeah. sure. Oh yeah. That well, I see, I'm a cafeteria Catholic, so, you know, I just kind of pick and choose, you know. So, uh, I, you know, and, and that doesn't work for some people, you know. And I, you know, my, my, my mother's told me many times you can't go to communion until you go to confession. You know, I'm like, God, whatever. Um, but for me, 
um, in my journey, I've been through some pretty dark places. And I, when I went to the church, I was so lucky that I had really cool priests who reached out to me and helped me through that. And I think the sad thing is I know so many people that were in a dark place and they went to a priest and he said, how long has it been since confession? You know, and these, you know, they're all the rules. It's all about the rules. And we've lost a lot of people, you know, and a lot of people have fallen away because of the rigidity of it. And I think there's millions of Catholics who are very free thinking, but they love their faith and they're not going to leave their faith because they disagree with the doctrine. You know, and so that's kind of how I reconcile that, and and I do that. I did that very deliberately because if they conceive you to be an atheist or you know not a non-believer, then they, they just think you're evil. You know, then they're not even going to listen to you. But if you're Catholic, then it's kind of like, okay, she you know worship is Satan, but I'll listen anyway. You know, so <laughs> whatever. So it's t I mean, that's what Bob Jones was telling people. I'm telling you. Okay. Anything else? God, you guys have been great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.